I would personally say that what background you come from should not put you off taking risk under any circumstances. I'm not a good networker. I hated hacking as it's described at Oxford. I very much concentrated on people who would back me. I've always had an unhealthy relationship with authority. Probably at five, I was already anti-establishment. I'd stopped enjoying it. It was just about making money and I didn't actually enjoy what I was doing anymore. I would like private schools to be mixed socially and very diverse. I personally think that would give a vastly better education. Welcome to our In Conversation With series, where we interview some of the most exciting figures in business today and ask them how they really did it. On today's episode, Joe is sitting down with Guy Hans. Take us back to where it all started. Now you were born in London, but grew up in South Africa. What are some of your earliest memories as a child growing up? Yeah, I mean, I was born in London, then went, um, my parents were South Africans. So I went to South Africa. Um, my parents had a problem with apartheid, um, didn't approve of the regime at all. And we actually went to what was then called Southern Rhodesia, Harare, where my father was a, a barrister and my mother was a teacher. I have mixed memories from there. Um, I remember being very, very happy. Um, but I remember coming, when I left and coming to England, being very terrified of uh, the police and authority. And my mother said that was because of what I witnessed in Harare at that time. Uh, Smith had just come in. My parents decided they wanted to leave Southern Africa and um, came to England. Uh, England was very, very cold by comparison. Um, but I think I was reasonably happy uh, through to going to primary school. And um, then when I went to primary school, um, I really, really you know, hated it. And uh, I suppose the next, the next period of my life from really 15, so from five through to, you know, age five through to university was really just a constant battle. And um, just hate, an absolute hatred of school. And what were some of the battles you were facing at that time? You said that your experience growing up in South Africa created a fear of the police, a fear of authority. Did that transmit itself into school life as well? I think in some ways it, it did because I've always had a, I've always had a unhealthy relationship with authority um, in, in that it's something I bristle against and I don't see as being supportive of uh, the, the average person. And to me, authority from South Africa and Rhodesia at that time through the police and the soldiers, my mother said I cut all the heads off all the soldiers I had. had. Um, I think that translated into a feeling that school was a, another representation of authority. So my relationship with my teachers was not particularly good. Um, it was It was adversarial. And in fact, even when I went to university, some of my was tutors there, my relationship with them was very adversarial. And when you were at school, like, were you recognized as someone who was kind of you know, talented and gifted by you know, your parents and, and peers or, or even yourself? Or, or was that a later realization that you thought you were someone who had a certain set of gifts that you could, you could utilize to really make an impact? It's really a story of two halves. On the one hand, I was doing really badly at school. Uh, eventually, I was sent to a, a psychiatrist to try and work out what, what it was because my mother had all the sort of results being in education. She had all the results from when I was like one, two, three, and then all of a sudden the results when I was like five, six were the complete reverse. So I couldn't learn to read and write. My speech was really very bad in terms of the pronunciation and my vocabulary. Um, the psychiatrist discovered I was very, very severely dyslexic. Um, and that, you know, on tests, I, some tests I scored less than 50. So very set, very mentally subnormal, as it would have been described in those days. And other tests I was scoring, you know, around 200. So there was just this complete mixture. Um, his view um, was that, slightly bizarrely, was that my mother should get me to join the Gifted Children's Association. And so he... So they, they did that. That didn't help at all in a lot of ways. In fact, it made socialization much more difficult. So now you had a kid at school who's doing really, really badly, and yet his parents say, well, he's gifted. Um, and I, I actually think that made the, made the bullying worse 
because the teachers enormously resented it. Um, and on top of that, my view of authority, I think, meant that I became quite, I suppose you describe today, sacrilegious. So I decided I was a Buddhist, which didn't go down very well in a Christian school. <laughs> um, and I think just the bullying got worse. I would say some of the teachers were definitely joining in the bullying. The headmaster gave no support. And eventually, um, I flipped and had a physical battle with one of the kids, um, which one of the teachers saw and decided it was me, and I had to leave um, and was sent off to a special school uh, in Somerset, which dealt with children with severe learning disabilities or emotional behavior problems. And how do you sort of look back on that experience now? Like some people might describe that as in a childhood trauma and they're having to go go through that. Like, do you see that as something that's built you know, resilience and grit and created a sort of drive behind your success? Or are you still battling with you know, some of the issues of you know, being diagnosed as dyslexic in an era where people didn't understand, didn't understand that, even your teachers at school? Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, I think for a lot of my life, uh, probably through till I was probably in my late 40s, I really just buried it, um, didn't really, it wasn't alive in me. Um, I mean, the most extreme example of that is I went into hospital while I was at the school because one of the kids had tried to drown me. And I was there, I was in a coma for four days. And when I came round, I somehow convinced myself that I'd got sinusitis. Um, I was convinced my parents told me, they insist they never told me anything of the sort. They always explained to me what had happened. But I only actually found out from them in terms of a proper memory about four years ago. And when I found out, I suddenly found that I could go in the water and not get sinusitis because I was terrified of water that was going to give me these enormous pains. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a woman who deals with mainly children who've suffered, you know, trauma swimming and she got me to get comfortable again with water I can't swim very well up until then I swam very very well um, so I think a lot of my experience at school um, I suppressed and I really just wanted to focus on um, succeeding and you know giving a finger to the man I mean I probably at five I was already incredibly anti, anti-establishment. And I just continue it. So school to me was something I just needed to get through. Um, I just completely hated it. Um, and But when I read some of the letters I sent to my parents, which they'd kept when I was 10, 11, it's quite clear that I was not in a good place at that school. Um, and it was very difficult but as a child you want your parents not to feel that and certainly didn't I think what it gave me I, I'm not sure it gave me emotional resilience but what it did give me was this incredible desire to succeed and to give two fingers um, to all the teachers I experienced and frankly most of the kids I mean I only have one friend from school um, you know, from the school I went to and that's, you know, that's not great. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's not great. And after finishing school, you had quite a remarkable journey like getting into Oxford University. Can you just sort of take us through that? Like, how did you make that jump from being someone who was struggling at, at school, you were great in some areas, struggling in others, had a difficult relationship with your teachers and peers? Like what motivated you to even apply for university and continue with an academic education rather than just saying, I'm going to leave this period of my life completely behind and do something completely different? Yeah, I think I was very lucky in my, in my parents. The reality is I didn't want to go to university. Um, and I, you know, just, I wanted to go off and do photography, which I was good at and I enjoyed. And I um, had actually started door to door setting um, before I, had my interview at Oxford, and I was quite happy doing all of that. Uh, and the last thing I really wanted to do was to do academic work at university. Um, my parents, on the other hand, very much did want me to. And 
I got an A and an E, um, A in economics, uh, and E um, in physics, and that was my A level. So pretty bad grades. Um, they weren't good enough grades to go anywhere. I mean, except for actually, I could have, I could have gone to Belfast in the middle of tr troubles, but no English university would take me. On the other hand, with an A and an E, I was I had two A levels, so I could apply to Oxford. Uh, seventh term, having failed fourth term. Um, and I applied and went up for interview at Keeble, and Keeble said no pretty quickly. Um, and I just camped out in the Porter's Lodge at Mansfield and said, I'm not going home until I have an interview. And the principal secretary said, look, you know, go home and we'll call you. I said, you're not, you're not going to call me. If I go home, I'm never going to get an interview. <laughs> And the Keeble scouts let me stay in a room there. They didn't kick me out of this room. You know, so I stayed in a room at Keeble and didn't get kicked out. And every day I went along to Mansfield and just sat in the Porter's Lodge saying I wanted to have an interview. And eventually she agreed to me that, with, that she would let me see the principal and the chaplain for lunch. And they could interview me over lunch. And why camp outside Mansfield rather than any of the other colleges? Was it just a completely random decision or was it a particular draw no, there? No, it wasn't random at all. Um, Mansfield, I mean, was a private hall, which in those days meant that it had a slightly lower um, academic view. It wasn't actually fair because the results from Mansfield were very good. But the general view was you, you didn't apply to private halls. They were not the same as applying to a full college. And today, Mansfield is a full college. And even in those days, its academic results were e equal to any of the full colleges. Um, so that was one reason. The other was it was very, very low church, and it was non-establishment, and it had an open quad, so you could actually get into the quad, which meant you could camp um, in the Porter's Lodge. You couldn't have done it at the other colleges. So there were a couple of, there was a practical reason, um, there was an academic reason, um, and there was a social reason, which was they were non-conformist, non and that was really important to me. I didn't want to apply to somewhere which was public school. I was state school. Uh, I needed somewhere which was willing to take an alternative view. And the interview was very alternative. And that's when and I got in based on the interview, which was a very different interview. And I, you know, I'm very grateful to Mansfield for taking me, but they they didn't take me on my academic qualifications and they didn't take me on my academic expectations. They took me because they found me as someone very interesting who they felt would benefit from an Oxford education. And what was university experience like? Now, were you still you know, facing some of those battles down that you, you know, faced at, at school? Or was it a fundamentally different experience in terms of your, your social life, your interests? Like, did you feel you became a different, different person? What was it like? At that stage, it was still very, um, very public school. And so there was a whole lot of Oxford, which I felt was very much closed off to me. But there was a whole lot of Oxford which was opened up to me. I think the biggest thing I found, and it sounds rather terrible, but these mythical people who I'd sort of thought must be vastly brighter than me and vastly more sophisticated. Yes, I was pretty uncouth, but they weren't. They, weren't, they were nothing special. They were just normal people. I met some incredibly bright people intellectually. And that, that wasn't an area I was ever going to be able to go into. And I met some great academics. But again, that wasn't an area I was going to go into. But in terms of day-to-day -day life, uh, business life, or politics, um, they didn't seem to be untouchable. Um, they had enormous confidence. Um, and it took me to out in my 30s to better make a speech which was half reasonable but besides their confidence and their real ability to present things in a very polished way they really didn't they didn't impress me that much um uh, i think in fact what it probably did for me was get me even less convinced by the british establishment and so i came to the view that I either wanted to work for myself or work for a foreign organization, but I really didn't want to work for a British organization. 
I couldn't take the social class structure, which was very strong at Oxford in those days. So there were a whole load of clubs, which there's just no way I was ever going to want to be a member of them or would they ever have taken me. You know, the very clubs that, you know, Boris Johnson, Cameron, etc., became part of. And I didn't resent people becoming part of them. What I resented was that they felt they would then rule the country. And to me, they were seen such a narrow side of society. I felt it was just very, very harmful. And what I wanted was to see a much broader society. And in reality, what I chose was to see an international society, to see different parts of the world. So to work in international businesses. And how did you grapple with that dynamic at Oxford between, on the one hand, there's a sort of a, an establishment there and the people from um, from a very sort of networked set of backgrounds and you're from a very different background. How, how do you grapple the dynamic of staying true to your roots, but also trying to take advantage of the opportunities of stepping into a new environment where you can benefit from some of the kind of elite networks that the other students are, are have inherited themselves? I think, and it's probably still true today, I'm, I'm not a good networker. I hated um, hacking, as it's described at Oxford. Um, I very much concentrated on people who would back me. So it was slightly bizarre that I had a lot of backings when I stood from socialists and from Thatcherites. Um, so both the right and the left. Um, in those days, I actually had backings from the Israel Society and had backings from the Palestinian Society. So I basically was seen as the sort of anti-establishment character, right through to when I actually stood for the first time in, for the, cons in the Conservative Party. Um, I, I stood on a, 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 the side of a, a group which literally as its um, manifesto had stop the fix, piss poor. And it had a picture of a guy pretending to urinate against a tree. So it was against the establishment at the time. Now, the, the, the other side was very much the sort of what the Conservative Party wanted to portray itself as. And I was a Thatcherite, but I didn't necessarily believe what Thatcherism was about was what this Conservative establishment thought Thatcherism should be about. So to me, it was a disruptive political movement. Not a, not a movement about establishing an, another establishment. Um, and that sort of was a, so it was radical conservatism uh, to basically break down the establishment, not reinforce the establishment, which I saw most conservatism has been about. And to some extent, that battle has continued in the Conservative Party for 40 plus years. It hasn't been resolved. Brexit was meant to resolve it and it hasn't resolved it. Mm. I was an anti Brexiter. Um, because to me, that was the only reason for that battle was this battle which existed back then at, at Oxford. So I felt I stayed pretty true to my beliefs. And I, and I got involved in, you know, I was a conservative who got involved in the Federation, from Oxford who got involved in the Federation of Conservative Students, which most Oxford people never did. They, they regarded that as something which was just inappropriate to be connected in because it's, it's other universities, it's below us. And I got involved in the National Union of Students. And that was seen as completely heresy as a conservative. And I got involved in Oxford University Students' Union. And I got involved in the Oxford Union. And I ended up losing um, the place below um, uh, president by one vote after three recounts um, for, at, in the Oxford Union. And I lost it to a Wickhamist. And you know, he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I'm sorry about this old chap. I'm sure we'll be friends. And you'll support me in my next election. And I just said, you, you must be kidding. <laughs> and just, you know, didn't quite spit at him, but made it very clear I wouldn't. And then I had people say to me, you know, in the bar, sorry, guy, we couldn't vote for you because we just had to vote for the public school person. And I suddenly realized that actually th that division was really strong. Now, I think it's very lucky for my life I didn't become president of the Oxford Union. My, my speaking ability was terrible. Um, and people were voting for me as the anti-establishment candidate. They weren't voting for me for any other reason. Um, so, you know, it was probably better that he, he won, particularly as he had a long lineage of political background going back to, I think, the 
1920s. Um, but it, it did show me that, that establishment difference. And I don't think I've ever really managed to come to terms in, in the UK with it. I've always felt an outsider. And when you were at university, you know, participating in the Oxford Union, various different political societies, you must have brushed shoulders with a lot of people who ended up you know, becoming you know, politicians or rising to the top of, of different um, uh, culturally influential organisations. Why do you think it is that Oxford University produces so many of these of these people? You no, know, it's produced more prime ministers than any other university. That why do you think that is, and, and do you think it's a, a good thing? the country based on what you experienced at university it's very interesting i mean the, the people who get there a lot of them are incredibly talented incredibly hardworking, and incredibly driven what's bad is they don't have a more broad experience of society and of life and i think that's the huge problem um, that we face in british society it's not that the people are wrong it's that they get the wrong experiences and they form the wrong conclusions. And we reward people in the wrong way. It's, it's a much more difficult and radical problem, frankly, than just with choosing the wrong people. A lot of these people are incredibly good. And I look at some of the people I knew, knew through Oxford who've gone into politics or gone into law or gone into business, um, less in business, but quite a lot in other areas. And they're very talented. Um, they don't scare me because I think they're on an, you know, a pedestal. Um, but they do have real talents. That what they don't have is this broader experience. And they end up in a self-reinforcing microcosm where they're told that's the right way to think and that's how it is. And often those thoughts actually come from Oxford because that's where they learned it. So they have that focus and strength to achieve something, but then you wonder why they're achieving it without having that broader understanding. And so it's a little bit like, you know, becoming a great footballer and your team succeeds, but actually the team doesn't do any good for the local community and it's not connected. And, you know, nowadays one would look at a football team and say, how does it help the local community? What is, it, what is it doing for society? We don't just look at a football team and say it can win games. To some extent, Oxford was just about winning. The pressure at Oxford to succeed, I felt, was enormous. I couldn't succeed playing the game everybody else played, so I played a different game. Um, and if anything, the separation between me and the game I could play increased. And, and I felt that, that to me, was the big problem that I saw when I was at Oxford. There just was not that connection. You, you spoke to people who were clearly felt they were going to rule the country, and they, they weren't that interested in anything but the, the collection of people who would reinforce their views. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, from my view, I want, if I could change two things in society, which I think really would make a difference. It would be how people go through their educational process and who goes with it. And in the second one, I'd want a vastly greater integration within society. You know, I, my wife and me gave, gave money to Seven Oaks School, which is a private school, so they would have scholarships to take people who came from underprivileged backgrounds. I would like private schools to be mixed uh, socially and very diverse. I personally think that would give a vastly better education for the kids who go there. I, I think it's just appalling that if you go to a private school, you for most private schools, you will not mix with anyone but people from that particular economic background. And then you can go to university and mix with people from th that economic background. And then you can go into a consultancy firm or a bank or a law firm and mix with people from that economic background. And then you'll find yourself in politics running the country and you've never actually experienced anything in your life, as I, as I sort of said, but, but cloisters. You can go from a prep school with cloisters to, a, to a, a public school with cloisters to a university with cloisters to a law firm with cloisters 
to the House of Lords with cloisters and you've never actually done anything but step in the cloister. And yet you're ruling the country. So to me, that is just an appalling situation. I think it's held Britain back for generations. I really do. I think the, 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 the power of the British society is incredible, but it's held back by being led by people who are very narrow-minded. So what you're advocating for, I suppose, is almost like a pragmatic version of that anti-establishment instinct that you had from a, a young age, you know, assisted places at private schools and you know, changing the, the student body at, at Oxford. What, what would you say to someone who says, actually, I don't want to play a different game within these elite institutions. I just want to reject these elite institutions completely and do things a, a different way. Do, do, you, do you think that is a, a valid approach for, for a young person? Like, do, do you think a, an academically gifted young person should reject going to Oxford University nowadays and just decide to go on a completely different route? Or, or do you think that pragmatic sort of anti-establishment idea that you sort of advocated for, which is sort of join these elite institutions, but try and disrupt them from the inside is, is a better way to, to make an impact? I think that's a really, really difficult question. Um, do you revolt from the outside or do you revolt from the inside? Um, I think as I've got older, I probably move more to having sympathy from revolting from the outside. Um, I'm, you know, to some extent, I'm doing the reverse of what Churchill says one should do. You know, Churchill says one should be a socialist when one's young and become a capitalist as one gets old. You know, and I tended, I, I was so obsessed, I mean, I'd almost say addicted to trying to find a way to give two fingers to the educational establishment and succeed. And it really was important to me to do that, that I didn't really, when I was young, think about revolting from the outside because I wanted to have the trappings of the inside. Um, you know, I wanted, I never did it, but I wanted to have that when I left school, I wanted to have that Rolls Royce to go back to the school and give them two fingers. And so that, that feeling of needing to be able to give two fingers to the establishment in their own area um, was very, very strong to me. Today, um, I'm, you, know, you could say I'm lucky enough that I'm sitting you know, in an economic position where I can choose to give two fingers um, from the outside. Um, I don't choose to do that. I try and be reasonably measured on the inside. Um, but I have a lot of sympathy for people who would revolt from the outside. And I think, again, you know, my South African background, and as I've got older, having a better understanding of revolution in South Africa, and understanding violent um, protests against apartheid. You know, it's sort of, I, I've often asked myself the question, if I'd been 18 in South Africa, would I have joined the ANC and would I have been willing to die for it? And I think the answer to that probably, I would like to hope the answer to that is yes. So to your question about what I say to somebody who, wants to have revolution from the outside. I think it depends. You, you have to decide how bad is it. Apartheid is, in, is so, so bad that violent revolution is acceptable. Um, is the fact that the UK doesn't get the best out of the whole of society enough for violent revolution? I, I don't think it is. But to some people, it might, they might feel it. So I would say you've got to take your, your line on there. And I don't, I, I can't believe there are many people who can sit there and say that the ANC was today, who can sit there today and say the ANC was wrong. To me, the ANC was quite clearly right. And violent revolution in South Africa was essential for political change there. And that political change was, was essential. And apartheid was, was truly, truly evil. Um, so, and my father's always had that strong belief and the reason he left southern africa was he just didn't want to be a part of the system and he wasn't with children willing to revolt so if you'd asked me at 18 do i think i would hope i revolted yes if you'd asked me 28 with children 
would you have done violent revolution? The answer probably is no. And I think that's a thing which I've realized as I got older. You're, you have this loyalty to family. And once you've got children, you've got to really think about it differently. But I think if I was today sitting there, age 18, saying, do I want to go to Oxford and change the system from within? Or do I want to be outside of the system? I think it's a very difficult choice. Sitting there with money, it's much easier choice. I'd probably do it from outside. If I didn't have the money, I think I'd probably want to do it inside. It's a little bit like music bands. Some of the music bands which, which preach the most radical statements, when you look at it, come from very good backgrounds. And they've got plenty of money. Um, you know, the reality is human beings are human beings. One can say it's hypocritical, but actually all human beings are hypocrites. We, 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 we do stuff which is good for ourselves. And for me, I, needed to, I felt I needed to make that money. At some point, I really didn't need it anymore. And I should probably have stopped, but I didn't. So you graduated from university, despite struggling with the exams, you got your degree, you don't become a violent revolutionary, you don't go into politics, instead you go into banking. What inspired that decision? And it wasn't something I wanted to do. I was facing bankruptcy. Um, I did a very uh, bad business deal. I took on a, uh, a uh, building in Oxford with a full repairing lease, and um, it started to physically collapse. And I just couldn't afford to reinstate it. So I borrowed money from the bank. Interest rates were very, very high in those days. And I ended I think probably about 21%. And I ended up with about £40,000 worth of debt, which would have brought you, in today's terms, a million, over a million pounds worth of property. Um, I couldn't see any way to pay that debt back. And the only company out there which was paying... Uh, salary sufficient to cover the interest um, really was Goldman Sachs. And so I applied to Goldman Sachs. Um, careers advisor at Oxford told me I had absolutely no chance of getting in there. They said they only took people with first and they only take, and, and they've, they've got to have a blue at least as well. And so I applied there um, on Art Sake, which was my art gallery. I'd bought an art gallery by then. Um, I had an art, art gallery. With, and so I applied on Art Sake paper and it simply said on the paper, I'm a salesman. I've built my own business. I'm an Oxford University student. Um, I speak no languages, but I have a, good, I have a clean driving license. <laughs> and that was my CV. And um, an Irish chap called Jamie Kiernan and decided I'd be quite a good, fun person to have lunch with. Lunches seem to feature quite a lot in my life. So I had lunch with Jamie Kiernan uh, in the Randolph. And um, I made the mistake of ordering soup, and they brought me this huge spoon. And I managed to get the soup virtually down, all the way down my shirt. And I think Jamie just thought I was probably the most uncouth person he'd ever come across, but I was worth being seen by Goldman Sachs. And they took me on as a trader, not as a salesperson, but as a trader. Um, so I was really the first graduate trader they took on. They'd taken on MBAs, but not graduates. So they took me on, and um, I found myself thrust into the city of London as a trader in 82, just as we were leading up to, to Big Bang. And um, I couldn't have been luckier in my timing. Um, and I aimed to stay there just for a few years until I got rid of my debts and ended up staying there for 13 years. And what, what was Goldman Sachs like at the time? Was it men walking around in pinstripe suits and dungarees? Was it sort of very uh, old establishment vibes or, or in this sort of lead up to the Big Bang? Or were you seeing a, a different demographic of, of people working within the firm? And Goldman was very anti-establishment. Um, it, it was a Jewish bank. Uh, very Jewish. Um, it um, it saw itself as fighting the establishment. Um, Gus Levy, who was a trader, had had died a few years beforehand and died in a partners' meeting. And you didn't have traders running investment banks. I'm not even sure Goldman Sachs would have called itself an investment bank. You know, we were very, very small, very badly capitalized. Um, and the two heads were Weinberg and Whitehead, and Whitehead used to fly economy. Uh, he told us all that our job was to serve our clients. Um, we, it, the, the bank didn't short stock on the basis it was an, an un-American. Uh, it was just, um, it was an extraordinary place. I mean, it was very, very 
different. Um, we weren't meant to go out for lunch and see other banks. Uh, it was quite cultish. Um, I don't think, I mean, I had two years, my first two years, I don't think I saw a friend. I saw Goldman people virtually every evening and, and the weekends I, I saw my family and sometimes I saw Goldman people as well at weekends. So you were really immersed in the culture of being a Goldenite. Um, and the first four years there, I just absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, my, my senior boss, um, you know, was very East End, um, but very, very bright. And we traded against the world and we just tried to make as much money for Goldman as we possibly could, taking principal positions in bonds, while at the same time providing some form of a service uh, to the clients in providing them with some liquidity. But our main job was make make as much money as we could. And how did you sort of navigate your dyslexia and your kind of slightly, as, as you put it earlier, sort of uncouth persona within the firm? Did you kind of lean into that? Or was that something that you were actively trying to cover up when you first joined in those early years? And the uncouth one was, was slightly difficult because I turned up for my interviews in America wearing a polyester suit, polyester shirt, and a furry woolen tie. And they asked me to buy, when I joined, they asked me to go out and buy myself a new wardrobe from Brooks Collars of button-down button down Oxford shirts, etc. cetera, um, because they thought I looked like a salesman. Um, I did do what they wanted, but um, I didn't buy very many. I, I, I've never really liked button-down Oxford shirts, um, but I did agree to get a... I bought some secondhand Hermes ties from one of the traders. Um, so I had, I had those which I used to rotate. So I had nice Hermes ties and I sort of just bought white shirts. Um, and um, I think the suits I probably bought at Marks and Spencer's, but it, they, I got, they weren't polyester. They were reasonable, okay suits. So I, I toned down my uncouth appearance um, a bit. Um, in, in, in terms of... Um, the dyslexia, that was a problem. And I never admitted I was dyslexic. And the reason it was a problem was because the traders were, had heard of dyslexia and they were convinced that if someone was dyslexic, they would make a mistake on the trading lot, lotters. Um, I just was very, very careful and did things, did my, my actual blotters very slowly and double checked them. I also traded a lot through the into dealer brokers. So I tried not to have to use blotters as much. So there was always somebody else on the other side of the phone who I could check my numbers with. Um, and I only ever had one trading dispute in Crumbs, nearly eight years of trading and thousands, I mean, tens and tens of thousands of trades. So I was lucky. My dyslexia never really affected my numbers, though I would reverse numbers. and. Bizarrely, I didn't reverse numbers trading. I think I just took it very, very slowly um, and just double checked and double checked and double checked. And, and presumably, in those early years at, at Goldman, you're getting paid an increasingly significant amount of money. You know, you're, you're interacting with really interesting people. Like, what did it feel like at, at that point? Was it did it feel like a big lifestyle change? Did you feel like there was a tailwind? behind you and you were destined for success or, or, or did you still have that kind of fear that you were suppressing from your childhood that something was going to go wrong it was all going to come falling down at, at some point what, what did it feel like I, I always thought it was going to go wrong um, I've never lost that feeling um, so I, I constantly felt it was all about to go wrong and in about two sorry about 1989 um, I looked at getting out of it, and I really looked quite hard at getting out. And I actually wanted to go and uh, do something in the hospitality industry and buy an English vineyard, vineyard. And why was it that you wanted to get out? I'd stopped enjoying it. Um, it was just about making money, and I didn't actually enjoy what I was doing anymore. Um, it, it stopped being an intellectual challenge. Um, it has stopped being fun in terms of the people I worked with. Uh, Goldman had changed its culture quite a lot. It had gone from, we make money from our client, for our clients to we make money for ourselves. 
And although on the trading desk, we did focus very much on making money for ourselves, we also did try and give some liquidity. And in those days, liquidity was nothing like what it is today. We tried to give liquidity to our clients. And we tried to advise our clients on what they should buy based on what we thought was good. And then we would try and take the rest, take the money of the rest of the market. So we did, there was a, I wouldn't say it was a zero sum game between us and clients. It, you know. By two thousand, sorry, by nineteen eighty nine, Goldman had been through a cultural change, and the view was how do we use our brains to to make money. Uh, Whitehead and Weinberg had both gone, and the firm had radically changed. McKinsey had come in and done a lot of work on how we could make more money, uh, how we should be operated differently, and. It was a very different organization. It was much, much more profitable. I mean, the, 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 the profitability completely transformed. It grew very, very rapidly. And it was really a united focus on how can Mother Goldman get bigger and bigger with the aim of going public, um, which would mean an enormous amount of money for those people who were partners and everybody else we sort of left behind. And I was not going to become a partner. I upset enough people by then. If I was going to make partner, would that have changed my mind? I had a chance. Um, I keep saying 98, is 88. I had a chance in 88 um, to, go to, to go to Japan, but my wife said no. And so we didn't go to Japan. And that really was my last chance to make partner. I, I peaked very, very young. And the problem when you peak very young, young is you either make it or you don't. And if you don't, you build up an enormous amount of enemies. But 82 to 86 was wonderful. Goldman was McKinsey, McKinsey-sized in 86. By 89, it was really doing well financially and growing very rapidly. So, so you then left Goldman because that kind of culture that you first joined and loved had started to change. And you joined Numira afterwards, a uh, Japanese bank. Why why go to a, a Japanese bank from, from Goldman? Yeah, I mean, there's actually five years because between 89 and 94, I moved across into structured finance. And I did a lot of the securitizations, really innovative securitizations. So Goldman let me go into a small area, which was my own, um, called GAS, Global Asset Structuring. And there's a very small group of us, there's literally four of us. And we did some really unique deals. I mean, totally um, groundbreaking. Looking at businesses and saying, what are the cash flows and how can we finance this business at a much lower cost of capital? And that was transformational uh, for me intellectually, and it was transformational as it happens in a large, to a large extent for the, the way world finance went, because it was the real birth of securitization and securitization not about mortgages and credit cards, but securitization about whole businesses. And the, the concept of securitization is one that people might have heard a little bit of you know, due to its role in the financial crisis and various other films. How would you describe the idea of securitization to a, an 18-year-old who doesn't quite understand what it means? If you take a mortgage, uh, you borrow against your home. And the basic tenant is that you will earn money during your lifetime working to pay that mortgage back. Securitization is really what I was doing was you're borrowing against a company and you're hoping that company would earn money over the years to pay that loan back. The, the issue with companies is their earnings are a lot more volatile than individuals and mortgages. So up until I started doing it with companies, it had been done on mortgages, pools of mortgages, and it had been done on credit cards where you're relying on individuals paying their mortgage, individuals paying their credit cards. I started to do it on businesses and whole business securitizations. And the good news was that brought down the cost of borrowing to the companies. The bad news was that the volatility increased. In other words, the chance of it going wrong increased substantially. And if it went wrong, you wouldn't be able to pay the loan back. And then you wouldn't have an individual not be able to pay a mortgage back. You'd have a whole company not being able to function. So it was a vastly more risky form of activity. 
Uh, and by two, sorry, by 1994, I decided that actually, if it worked, I wanted to be principal because it was so profitable. And if it didn't work, um, my job was to make sure it did work. And I felt I had the skill to do that. So I went to Goldman and said, rather than us doing these securitizations for other companies, and you know, one of the companies we did was Saks Fifth Avenue. So you're basically taking all the Saks business and saying, we're going to make this much profit each year and we'll borrow against that, those cash flows, we'll securitize those cash flows. And we, we'd got it right. And we made a, a fair bit of money. I think, I think something like 15 million was made by my department. And that seemed fine, but if you but the actual economics of the deal made hundreds of millions. So I went to Goldman and I said, look, the pub industry in the UK is seen as a really bad area to lend money at the moment. I think that's nonsense. I think people don't understand how pubs work. And I'd like to go out and spend a billion buying pubs and then do a securitization of the pub industry. And I said that to, to John Corzine, who was just about to become head of Goldman and I, in Phoenix Airport. And he looked at me and said, uh, no. And I decided I was leaving. And then the question was finding someone who would back my ideas. And Namur at the time was doing unbelievably well. And they had all this money coming out of their ears, but didn't know what to do with it. And I pitched the idea to go, I, I pitched the idea which I pitched to Goldman to Namur. I pitched it to a number of other banks. And Namur said yes. And so I took a pay cut from earning in the, in the millions to earning 85,000 a year in return for a percentage of the profits and went to Nimeo and they uh, backed me to do my first pub deal after being there about eight months. Did that feel like a huge risk at the time or were you absolutely sure that was going to work? I definitely wasn't sure that was going to work. Um, I think without Julia, my wife, supporting me, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I mean, in the same way as I didn't go to Tokyo because she didn't want to go to Tokyo, um, and I didn't go into politics because she didn't want me to go into politics, I would listen to her on most major things, and if she was against it, I wouldn't do it. But she was supportive. Her view was this is something I had to give a go at. If I didn't give a go at it, I'd always regret it. And we both talked about it. We said, look, if it goes wrong, we'll sell the house, move into a smaller house, take the kids out of private school. And, you know, I'll, I can always become a double glazing salesman. I know I can sell door to door. And, you know, Julia said, look, you know, I can always go and continue to be a lawyer and go back to working as a lawyer full time. Um, you know, she was at Linklater's and she was very, very good at law. I've got no doubt in my mind she'd have made partner if she'd wanted to. So we weren't going to starve. Um, for me, it was my, you know, shot at really succeeding. And I just wanted to give it my best shot, you know, as, as in the movie Hamilton. Um, and so I did. And um, it did work. But it could well have not worked. I, I mean, it's interesting. When I look at virtually everything I've done in life, the difference between success and failure is so thin. You know, it's, it, it just is. And I think one of the strong beliefs I have is that people who come from underprivileged backgrounds and then end up in prison, they could be, if they come from the right background, exactly the same people running the country. And people running the country, if they came from backgrounds where they didn't have the benefits they had, could well be the people in prison. And I think there's a huge misconception that human beings have about how important they are to what happens and how much actually it's so much influenced by luck, your background, your friends, just where you are on that particular day. Um, and I, um, no, I really, I just passionately believe that there's an awful lot of lack of compassion and understanding that human beings have and it's almost like if you're successful, you have to sort of justify your success by believing somehow God gave it to you or you're so bright, you deserved it or you worked so hard. People don't want to admit it's just luck. 
looks looks scientific in uh, retrospect, right? Looking back, but actually at the time, it's it's pure mystery sometimes how how things happen. Like, what what's the lesson there for a young person if if luck and random variation really does play such a huge role in life and has played a big role in in the parts of your success? Is is the lesson that people who don't have wealth security stability should still have a high risk tolerance and they should still lean into risk because the rewards are there or do you think people should only take risk once they've got that secure footing that you mentioned that when you made that that jump to numera you did or been earning and multi-millions at, at goldman like do, do you think you have to get to a point of some degree of security and stability to increase your risk tolerance if you're someone who doesn't come from a inherited wealth background I think risk taking is almost uh, a genetic um, issue. There are plenty of people from good backgrounds who take absolutely no risks their whole lives. And there are plenty of people from very poor backgrounds who take a lot of risk. So I think risk is much more a, a personal thing. Um, it, it goes a lot with addiction. Um, and, you know, risky behaviors. I mean, you'd say that racing car drivers are willing to take a lot of risk. I, I'm sure that goes a lot further than just in the race car track. It's, yeah. So, and the same with, 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 with soldiers, you know, people in the SAS, they're taking a different, they're taking risk. And I'm sure it, it, it goes into their personal lives as well. Um, I, I, I would, personally say that what background you come from should not put you off taking risk under any circumstances. Um, I'd also say the one thing that while I say there's a lot of luck in it, there is, I think, the Arnold Palmer comment about him playing golf. You know, the more I practice, the better I find I am. And I think the more times you're willing to take risks, the more likely you are to get the opportunity to be successful. And, and, and one of the things is just to try somehow to face success and failure the same. And it's a big problem in British society. We go and say that people who are very successful aren't they wonderful and people who fail aren't they terrible. Actually, it's, it's normally two sides of the same coin. And the, the reality is if you fail, learn from those mistakes, but, but it doesn't change you. You are still the same person. You just failed. Just go for something else. Uh, if you succeed, don't suddenly think you walk on water. You're still the same person. And the next thing you do, you might fail at. And so I think I wake up every morning saying I could succeed today or I could fail today. The, the biggest problem I've ever had in life is that if I start to have a, a losing streak of failure, is stopping myself from thinking I am a failure and trying to keep it as an individual action. And that's really, really important because once you start seeing yourself as a failure you will fail and unfortunately a lot of the school system splits people into success and failures and in a way it breeds that incredible confidence from Etonians at Oxford to to politics just extraordinary it also destroys people the other way and it's absolutely appalling that it does that and I find it quite extraordinary that we live in a country where, and, and I'm including the whole of the British Isles here, including Guernsey, we live in a place where we try and somehow divide kids up into success and failure at such young ages. I mean, I don't think we should ever break anyone into success or failure. You know, McDonald's croc succeeded in his late 50s, early 60s. You know, you can, and he was a failure until then. You, know, you can fail your entire life and succeed at the end. You know, Churchill, you know, was a disaster, and then he s saved the you know the Western world. I I think we just need to understand that success and failure are the same things; they're just a different side of the coin. And for people to succeed, they've probably often failed first. And people who who succeed and have never failed first will probably fail later. And I just really hate the concept that we have failures and, su and successes. We have individual events which are successful. And we have individual events which, which fail. And, and that's it. I've never seen myself as successful. I see myself as had some successful events and some failures. I tend to spend more time in my, my mind thinking about the failures. And I, I, 
you know, there's a there's a comment that if you criticize someone, they will take criticism ten times as strong as praise. So you've got to give them, you know, ten positives to one negative. Uh, from my point of view, I would certainly say when I look at my life, every failure is ten times as more painful as the pleasure from each success. So when I add it up, I'm probably net net down rather than up. Um, other people might say I'm a success, but to me, if I had to choose, I would say I'm a failure. But I try not to do that. I try just to think about the individual events and say those individual events do not define me. That I am still me. It does seem there has been a slight shift in terms of the attitudes in the UK towards failure over the past couple of years. You now have like a number of high-profile podcasts that celebrate uh, failure, sometimes in quite a comedic a way and you'll often see you know TikToks of people talking about times they failed in life and how that was the um that was the route to their eventual success but do you think brits should be a bit more like americans in terms of celebrating failure rather than trying to cover it up yeah i i, I would beg to differ with you on on the way the uk is going um i i think you got a split between the under 40s and the over 60s um, and then the 40 to 60 year olds are sort of in the middle and don't quite know where they are. And I think on virtually every political or social issue in the UK, there is that divide. So I think a lot of people under 40, not all, but a lot of people under 40 are quite sympathetic to failure and are quite dismissive of success and are saying, what does it actually mean? What is that real success if basically the person then dies of a heart attack at 67? Have they really succeeded? or if they have no contact with their children, or if they get divorced, or whatever. I think for the over 60s, they're still very much stuck in the old, the old position of view of success and failure. Um, when you look at the voting in the country, you know, the average voter is like 67, They're incredibly old now. And that's largely because younger people don't tend to vote and older people do vote. And I really wish younger people would vote because it would change the political political parties enormously if they realized they had to appeal to a much younger audience. But they, at the end of the day, the Conservative Party knows that its average vote is going to be over 67. They need to appeal to them, and that's what they try and do. And it's, you know, it's the way democracy in the UK works, um, unfortunately, um, in my mind. So I don't think you're right. I think you're 100% right about podcasts, but I think if you actually looked at how many people watch these podcasts, how many people take any notice, it's quite small. It's like Engage, you know, the charity which we found to try and get people engaged in politics. It's a very, very small number of people actually go into the Engage website and start looking at it. Hmm. If you think in the 50s that the political parties in the UK had direct membership of over 10 million people, you know, one in, in those days is about just over, just over one in three voters actually belong to a political party. They were involved. Today, the Conservative Party is down to 160,000. And half of those joined because of Brexit. I mean, that is just a terrible statement of what's really happened in our political system. So, and our social system as well, because it's not just politics, it affects our entire social society as well. Mm. So on the one hand, for a certain age group, I think you're 100% right. Um, but I think there's an older age group which, which isn't there. And even for that younger age group, the level of bullying in schools is still pretty horrendous. And the acceptance of it in schools and the unwillingness of schools to regard that as something they should be involved in sorting out, to be honest, it's in some ways worse than when I was going to school, in that when I was going to school, it affected such a, it affected a small percentage of the, the class really badly, because it was largely physical, and therefore you could see it. Um, you know, you got your teeth knocked out, or you got a black eye, you could see it. Nowadays, it's through social media, it's insidious, and it affects them much greater. And the level of teenage suicide is way up. It's the level of university suicide is way up. So I would love to say that we live in a kinder society. Um, but I think, unfortunately, humanity, unless you really do a lot about teaching people that kindness is important, and, we, and it's not part of the school curriculum, 
I think it should be, but it's not. And that having humanity to each other is a core value. Unless you do that, I think humans do disagree, do disappear into Lord of the Flies, which I've never read, but I understand it's all about kids turning on and bullying each other. So moving back to one of your big successes, and after Numera, you found Terra Firma, and then over a you ten-year know, period, it becomes one of the biggest you know, private equity funds in Europe, and you become a, a known name around the entire city, and are seen as a, a giant of the European private equity industry. They become incredibly wealthy. What, what does it feel like to have that much, you no? Know, power, money, influence, and and control? Like, were you sort of sat there thinking, I'm the master of the universe, I can do anything here, everything is going right? Or or, or did you kind of have a, a sense that you needed to think carefully about what to do with the, the sort of uh, power, money, influence that you had? I think it's actually a sort of strange, strange situation, almost the exact opposite of what anyone rational would think would happen. It was actually only five years that basically Terra Firma succeeded in, and it was 2002 to 2007, and it was quite mind-blowing. I mean, we became the ninth biggest alternative manager by money it's raised in, in five years. Um, none of the, our competitors now is you know, worth less than tens of billions. And I had 100% of the equity of the business. Um, so on the face of it, you would think that I felt I was all powerful. Actually, what I felt from three years in, so from 2004, was I was becoming completely powerless. And the reason was I was switching from doing deals and using my brain intellectually to trying to raise money and run a multinational business. And I didn't have the training, the skills, or the personality for that. So from 2004 months, I actually was flandering around. Uh, you know, I was effectively drowning. I didn't realize it because while emotionally I felt it, I didn't have anyone really to talk it through. And I didn't have anyone to mentor me or coach me or sit alongside me and to run this because it was a found a business with just me. And 85% of the people who had been in the mirror with me left. And they left because the culture was having to change to fit in with institutions. Whereas in the mirror, we could be pretty zany and cranky and just do deals that we liked. Now we were having to appeal to big institutions and they wanted us to do deals which they liked. And there were 200 of them and we had to work out how on earth we did that. And I didn't have any time anymore to do due diligence. I had a little bit of time to look at the business at a very high strategic level, but that was getting less and less. Um, and we had all this money to invest. Um, the investment banks tried to persuade me to go public, which would have given us stock, which we could then have given people options, which maybe would have been able to hire people, but we were hiring enormous numbers of people, uh, and I was losing complete control. So I felt I was drowning and losing control, um, and my response was to try and hire more people. Um, and the outside world thought, you know, he's becoming the master of the universe. And then it all just went wrong, uh, and it went wrong. It, it, it went wrong because of the markets. You know, the intellect with EMI, which was a deal I'd looked at back in 2004, and we finally did in 2007 at a vastly higher price and a much worse banking environment, um, was a deal which I had an understanding of, and there were other deals which I wanted to do, which we didn't do. Um, it, it, it was a failure because of the financial markets, the actual strategic objectives were completely right and everything we did is what the way the music industry works today and it was a radical change but we would have failed I think if I'm honest I look back because I was not someone who could run a large multinational asset management business 
I was a deal maker. I liked doing deals. Um, I could think of strategy. I loved working with the companies. I didn't like the rest. And I probably should have, frankly, got a psychiatrist in 2006 and said, I'm about to raise another fund. How do I make my life sensible? And I was detached from my family. I was deeply unhappy in lots of ways. And it just was a mistake. Um, so at the very point where, from the world's point of view, I was really succeeding, I was really failing. And I was offered this award for you know, private equity personality of the decade. And I just didn't go, to, I just turned it down and didn't go to the thing, partly because I was out of the country by then, but partly because I just felt I'm not worthy. It's not actually right for me. It's not what I am. And I was, I got to, I got to a level where I really didn't have the skills or the personality to do the job I was basically expected to do. Um, it'd be much better if I'd basically gone to, I don't know, Blackstone or someone and said, look, do you want to have somebody who's going to want a quirky private equity fund, which does really interesting deals. And, you know, you raise the money for us on those deals and you provide the corporate governance and I will go and do, go and do the deals and work with the companies. Um, but I did EMI, uh, financial markets came disastrously. Citibank had put up most of the money. We put up a lot of money from two funds, plus a chunk of money for myself. And it all went wrong. Uh, and I ended up leaving, leaving the country. Uh, we're having a battle at the same time with the inland revenue over profits versus consolidated profit loss. Very technical battle, but very emotional for me. Um, in the end, the inland revenue dropped all of what they said because they realized that if they actually did it, it would destroy the financial services industry in the UK for anyone who took outside money from outside of the UK. Um, they somehow felt they should be getting taxation on everybody around the world's money. And we were putting it through Guernsey as a tax neutral location. So that if you were investing from Singapore, you didn't pay tax on your capital profits. And they wanted that tax and they somehow thought the best way to get it was to try and go through me. So it was personal um, and it would have destroyed the private equity community in the UK. And they did it with a hedge fund manager as well. And they, and they dropped it completely. Um, but by then I'd left the UK. And um, I think from then on, I spent the next 2009 until 2016 really focused just on trying to sue Citigroup, which was frankly a mistake. And it, it looks like a mistake now because we didn't win. But I think the real reason it was a mistake was it destroyed my relationship with a number of people. And I think those relationships are more important than anything else. But I felt that I had a duty to try and, if I was advised by the lawyers, there was a case, that I had a duty to follow that case forward. And lawyers will always tell you you've got a case. Um, so the next period of time from then um, was, was not good. I mean, very, very bad emotionally. I think... My, my strong view is I should have been strong enough to realize that, that my skill set was not running a large international asset manager. I'm a deal maker. And um, I should have realized that. I don't know why I wasn't strict enough of myself. Um, but I wasn't. And, and it's one of the things I'm really strict on when I hire people. And you know, often I, I'm looking at, I was looking for a CFO and I virtually automatically reject CFOs who want to be CEOs because I want a CFO. I don't want someone who wants to be a CEO. I want them to be a CFO, and it's a different role. And to some extent, I basically want to do deals, and wanted to do deals is probably more accurate now. And therefore, I should have said, Guy, you're a deal maker. You're not really trying to run a big international company. So just don't put yourself in that position because it's not what you want to do, even if you're going to be good at it. And, and I think that's important. I just did not apply that rule to myself. And I think that's one of the things I'd say to every young person. Do not do something you do not want to do because you won't be good at it. How, how do you distinguish, though, between sort of imposter syndrome in terms of 
just thinking you can't do something because you've never done it before or genuinely knowing actually this doesn't fit with my skill set my personality and my characteristics and the things that make me an impactful person yeah i don't know i mean i just when i look at myself i see a whole other things i'm not good at so i never really think about imposter syndrome i have people telling me guy you're not you're nonsensical you're very good at those things but i don't think i am so i don't recognize imposter syndrome because i just think i'm not good at those things um so i've never come across something which i think i'm not good at which i then think i'm good at i've come across a lot of things i think i'm not good at which other people tell me i am good at that's a different thing it's a little bit like the power thing um i've had people tell me i've got power and i actually feel i've got no power and i'm just like things so you take for example the portfolio of businesses which i run you know i go down to australia and tell them what i would like them to do and the, and then people say god guy you're powerful you've told all these people what to do and as far as i'm concerned the second i've got on that plane they do what they want i don't think i've got any power you know as far as i'm concerned they just you know i'm sure they once i've gone they go and drink a cold one and eat some steak on the barbecue and forget about me for the next year um and so i i feel powerless and yet people think guy you're standing up in that room and making that speech to all those people and they're listening attentively but they're only listening attentively till the end of the meal and then they and then, then I'm gone so i think it's very interesting i mean my view is that the ceo of a major company a big company is a little bit has as much power as the butter as a butterfly flapping its win, wings has on moving people it's really really difficult things happen through a ground swell of opinion in a company and i I, your question on power i don't feel powerful in any way um i once had a journalist say guy you see quite a large number of the royal family you must have a lot of influence through that i said no they they the only reason i see them is because i give money to charity and they're nice to people who give them money for their charities i actually admire their charities i think they're really good charities you know something like the princess trust i think does much more good per person than what the government tries to do for its money and I've done some economic analysis and this princess trust is about 3 to 4 times as efficient as the government um so yes I'm very happy to give money to princess trust but I don't think king charles would want to see me if it wasn't for the fact I give money to it and it's just he's been nice to the people who give money there's there's no influence there except for him being nice so he gets money for his charity which is a good thing um but no I don't I don't see that power thing at all and let, let's say you're a 21 year old in today's world would you do your journey all over again or would you go into an investment bank nowadays and then try and find a way to pivot into creating your own private equity fund or or do you think the future for young people who are interested in you no know, ideas you no know, disrupting industries is not in the financial sector i don't think it's in the financial sector no and i'd also say if it was in the financial sector i'm not sure i'd do it in the uk either anymore um for all sorts of reasons um but i probably wouldn't do the financial sector anymore i think today the real opportunity out there is for people who can learn management skills in um multicultural ways and apply those skills to international consumer businesses i i i i think the the the, the that to me is the biggest bang for the buck um so if you look at who can create the next apple who can take and recreate the marks as marks and spencers um who can take um something you know something like amazon and bring it to the next level so i think it's those areas where you've got the real chances to really make a big difference today the skills you need in those areas are very very different from the skills you needed to be successful financially interestingly those skills are far more likely to come from people 
who come from dis disadvantaged backgrounds. Because it's understanding your client. And so when I look at McDonald's, one of the big things we do, we've got 435 McDonald's restaurants in the Nordics. One of the important things is to have people who are close to the customer, to understand the community and understand the people working in the stores. And that is a very different community from those who go to the elite Stockholm universities. And what's interesting is if you run a McDonald's restaurant well, your turnover is about double as running it badly. Same product, same method of service, etc. You know, we have dry foods who take 400 seconds to give somebody that get somebody their food, and we have dry foods who do it in 120. The profitability, if you can do it in 120, is vastly more than 400, and you get fast, vastly more orders. So, a good restaurant, a good restaurant will make 500,000 cash a year. A bad restaurant loses money. A good one makes 500,000. Our good franchisees will have probably 10 restaurants. That's 5 million a year. They're not enough. They're not many banking jobs today which pay 5 million a year. So if I was a 16-year-old who really wanted to succeed but said I'm not academic, you know, I'd join McDonald's, quite frankly, um, because I can have a restaurant by the time I'm 30, and by the time I'm 40, I can have 10. And we have people who've done that. And so... I think, look out of the box, if I was intellectually, academically bright, I'd probably look at getting on a really good training program um, in terms of management where there is lots of training and lots of education. One of the things I say to all our businesses, I want to spend 10% on training. They look at me as I'm completely mad. And when I say 10%, I mean 10% of what the cost of an individual is. Um, they do think I'm insane when I say that. And they say we could never pet spend that. Well, I know how much time I spend on training each week. It's about five hours. And that, to me, is a really valuable investment. You know, if I'm training at 63 and still think I've got a lot to learn, you know, we should be taking, well, in McDonald's, we take 16-year-olds and we start training them. You know, we give nearly 10% of the employees in Denmark, we pay for them to go to university. Uh, we're paying for some PhDs in Finland. You know, to us, education is absolutely essential. I look at our cow business down in Australia, which we set as a target to be 50% woman in 2016 in an industry which is totally male-dominated. And we are now 48.5% women with 70% of the applicants are female now. Um, you know, that was a complete transformation. But we do an enormous amount of education there in all the stations. We have people doing, you know, academic training in husbandry and supply chain and you know, biomedicine even, you know, right across the spe spectrum to try and get people to continue to learn and continue to think. And it's not just about what you learn, it's about what it does to your brain and keeping it open. So, yes, I wouldn't go into banking, definitely. But Guy, it's been incredible sort of hearing your story, the, the struggles, the successes, the failures, and also a sense of what the future looks like for young people. Just to finish off, if you could go back in time and impart just one lesson to 18-year-old Guy, who's starting at university, starting to think about his future and what sort of person he wants to be and what he wants to do, what is the main lesson that you would impart on your younger self that you think could have made your journey so much easier? You can't have it all. Uh, there are probably three important things in most people's lives today, uh, which are family, friends, work. It used to be country, but today I'd say it's family, friends, work for most people. When you're in your 20s, uh, you can have work and friends, and that's fine. When you get married, something has to go. In my case, uh, a lot of it was friends. Uh, I spent a lot of time initially with family, and it was family and work. I would say I think I should be more balanced and done less work, more family, more friends. Um, so my advice would be, remember you can't have it all. Because I think that was a big mistake I made. I definitely thought I could have it all, and I definitely couldn't. 
fantastic. This has been an incredible episode, Guy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching the video, guys. If you're interested in our mission and want to find out more, click the link in the description below.